Good afternoon, everyone. I believe you agree with me. It's very hard to keep uh, the session after lunch. So please bear with us. We will have a, a set of uh, panel members here, and I would like to call upon them to come forward. Uh, Ibu Ati, you please uh, take your seat while I'm introducing you. Oops. And then pa was well, second on. Pa Rafles, is he there? Please come forward. Maaf pak, saya operasikan pakai. Kembalikan ke semula pak. And then we would like to have Andrew Campbell. Uh, and then four other speaker, uh, pa. Solihin, is he around? Yes. And then Ibu Hesti. Pak Kato. And Professor Maas. Please come forward. Right. So while our panel are taking their seat, uh, we already had a very interesting session this morning talking about the same topic but from the perspective of national and global policies and related issues including the economy, uh, political economies. Um, in this session we will be uh, talking about how we implement those policies and expect to have response from the audience. So the way I would like to organize this session would be uh, letting our first three speaker, uh, Ibu, Hes, Ibu Ati, Ibu uh, pa Rafles, and pa Andrew Campbell, uh, to talk about um, issues related to communicating with stakeholder, uh, informing the information, and uh, how to uh, take them into the discussion on this. Uh, important activities managing uh, degraded and conserved peatland and we would also uh, learn how the control of fire uh, communicated with them and uh, it's really on the implementation aspect of it and from Andrew Campbell we would like to hear how the international uh, initiative is uh, taking part in this process and more specifically we'll be talking about how important it is to take care of the livelihood of people because restoring and managing peatland without their participation would be hard, if not impossible. And um, after the three speakers, we would like to invite you to comment and ask questions and, you know, uh, if you need more clarification. Uh, and then I will have the next speaker, Pa. Uh, Solihin to talk about the map and again the map is uh, a tool to, to, to do that in, on the ground and how the map can be used to help uh, people and policy group to uh, implement uh, the uh, management of, of uh, peatland. And then we will hear another implementation aspect which, is, which was also discussed this morning. Uh, Ibu Hesti will be talking about paludi culture specifically. Uh, not only how to do that, but also how important it is from the economic point of view, from the livelihood of people. Um, so that uh, we will hear on the practical uh, aspect of, of this uh, operation. And then the next one, we'll hear how in private sector, this issue is also discussed in terms of managing water level, controlling the level of water so that the emission can be uh, reduced and controlled, uh, but also taking care of the productivity in uh, the context of uh, high-yielding uh, acacia manjum operation in West Kalimantan by Mr. Kato. And then finally, we'll hear from the academic. Uh, pa Maas will be talking about uh, emission uh, of greenhouse gases and how this practical aspect of controlling water, uh, paludic culture will help uh, uh, 
managing or mitigating the issue of greenhouse gas emission. So um, I will be helped by our rapporteur. Can you stand, Ibu Haruni is sitting there, and uh, recognize your help and please take care of what we've been talking. We are going to talk here. Uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite the first speaker sitting next to me, Ibu Ati. Uh, you have you are charged to, to talk about this issue of communication, how stakeholders are engaged. And I believe uh, this is a new job for you. Ibu Eti is a new director for uh, peatland uh, control, uh, uh, damage control, or whatever related to the restoration. And uh, while taking your new job, perhaps you can also ask participants how to, to support this idea, because they are resourceful people. And I believe you, you have a lot to, to share with us. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, distinguished uh, moderator, Prof. Daniel, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Thank you for giving me opportunity to share the information for what have we done so far. Of course, in the pitland restoration and management in Indonesia. It is honorable for us, me, myself, and also our team here to be in charge in this session. Pitland is a fragile ecosystem as we already listened from the first season. A home of huge diversity and also a store of huge amount of carbon. And we have a lot in Indonesia, over 15 million across from Aceh to Papua that this is our hard work to take care of that. The main problem in the pitland ecosystem in we uh, restore and manage is uncontrolled damage, improper water management system, causing serious problems including dry of pitland and land subsidence. This will, this will cause uh, the occurrence of fire forests and land dispersion, land leading to the release of greenhouse gas emission and floods. This problem, mostly from unsustainable manners, human activity on pitland with economic development, poverty, culture, behavior, and also belief, and also the limitation of knowledge, and so on as a big background. In principle, we already listened from the first session that the principle of managing and protecting the peatland ecosystem is make it wet. There are several important considerations to be taken. The first one is about inventory. Determine of the peatland hydrological unit and peat ecosystem function establish pitland ecosystem protection and management plan, what we call in Indonesian language is RPPAG, and water table measurement, also monitoring and recovery, including water table monitoring, development, water management, infrastructure, and also restoration and rehabilitation with land succession and revegetation. The government regulation number 71 of 2014 and amended by the government of regulation 57 2016 gives mandate and authorization to several stakeholders to conduct pitland protection and management among the other governments at all levels, state, province, and also district level, concession holders, concession holder in the uh, industrial forest, HTI, and also the cultivation permit, community as well. Article 26 of government regulation number 71, 2015, clearly mentioned that every person prohibit to land clearing in pit ecosystem function where 
drainage or canal causing dry of peatland, peatland burning and conducting activity resulting exceeding the peatland ecosystem damage characterization and criteria. The Ministry of Environment and Forestry has duty to conduct monitoring and inspection of the implementation of peatland protection and management in concession area or non-concession area. And consolidating the implementation of peatland restoration and management amongst stakeholders, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry established several regulations and guidelines as already mentioned by Mr. Kaliansha in the first session. Science, technology, and well-knowledge will an essential and playing an important role in ensuring the implementation of those regulations in achieving the target of peatland protection management. The knowledge exchange and information sharing among stakeholders are very valuable in encouraging mass action. In knowledge and information exchange among stakeholders, first we have to identify and characteristic of the stakeholders, their role, their duty, and also the needs to involve, actively involve. Secondly, we have to identify what kind of packaging and language to communicate with them because we have to communicate with stakeholders or participants' language, not in ourselves' language, to make them understanding more. And the most important also, we have to recognize what kind of incentive that we have to provide to identify or to recognize for what they already uh, involved so far. In the first slide, allow me to borrow the slide from Mr. Kalian Shah. In the first session, we categorize the stakeholders based on the peatland heterological unit and also peatland ecosystem function. The government regulation number 71, 2014, and amended by the government of regulation uh, number 57, 2016, that I already mentioned, give them authorities to uh, in Fourth, in the uh, pitland management, conducted the pitland protection management based on this categorization. Among other participants or among other stakeholders are, as I already mentioned before, the government at state level, province level, and district level, and also the consensus holder and community, and also supporting for the university expert and other resource person. In enhancing the stakeholders' involvement, established technical guidance, development information system, clearing house, and capacity building, and also incentive, economic incentive or other incentive provided is play an important role. What is the challenge of the uh, enhancing the knowledge and information exchange when the regulation have been established. The key point is availability and accessibility in general meaning, not only in the quantity, but also the quality and also well understandable. In the current situation, we still face the several gaps. Firstly, the scientific base. There are so many terminology, as I learned, within two months. And also several methodologies that we use, technology, in implementing the protection and restoration of pitland in Indonesia. Secondly, the availability and accessibility in terms of quantity and frequency to access the data, information, and also technical training, consultation, facilitation, and so on. The third is the accuracy and accountability data in the term of quality, provided data, training material, and also facilitator competency. 
Another thing that we also have considered is taking packaging in this knowledge, in this knowledge and information exchange. With regard, we consider about the language barrier and also a knowledge barrier and media barrier. The gap cause varies or different understanding, perception, and impl in implementation in the field. In our team experience, when our team review the concession holder document for pitland recovery planning, we need several days due to the perception, different perception of the stakeholders and they submit different data that we order as we provided guideline in the regulation, uh, ministerial regulation number 15 and number 16. Slide four, please. And the pitland ecosystem restoration based on the community and enhancing the community participation, we develop facilitator from university, local heroes, and also local government for these activities. And also, next slide. This is uh, for the uh, concession holders. The parameter, the order, the uh, regulation already provide. For example, that we have to do the water level management, they have to uh, pointed the uh, point, uh, uh, compliant point, and we have to do the rehabilitation. But as I already mentioned before, in reviewing, reviewing one document, ecosystem pitland uh, restoration planning, we need several days because of the different data that we have to ask to uh, change or to uh, improve to the stakeholders. Slide six and this is the data that we already provide, uh, the, the water uh, level uh, monitoring system that we put it in the database system that easy for us to uh, uh, monitor in what level and this data from the uh, concession holders. And next please. This is also, this is the system for the real time data for the uh, water level management, water level monitoring. Next. This is also the, the system that already uh, linked to the uh, PMKG and also the uh, PNPB. And next, please. This is still the similar, the real time data monitoring. Next. Please. This is the Sipongi that later on we can uh, learn from uh, uh, Pak Rafles. I think the conclusion, next. We have done a lot. The achievement is already a lot, but, but still more in progress. The problem is we have to still improve in how to communicate to the stakeholders how to provide data and ensuring the accessibility, the availability, and the accuracy of data that we provide. And also, of course, language is very important. In this matter, we have to learn one term. Please stand in other partitions to communicate well, to understand what they need so far and last thing we still develop the incentive currently based on the regulation government regulation uh, regarding to the uh, economic incentive for environmental protection and uh, management thank you very much thank you ibu Ati. give applause to ibu Ati. Uh, a lot uh, have been done um, just to make sure we we deliver the message here um, this morning, we, we had an interesting conversation where the Ministry of Agriculture were here and talking about uh, water level control and things related to plantation. Do you consider uh, other government agencies are also stakeholder in this stakeholder communication and improving the exchange of information? Yes. 
Uh, in reviewing the document that uh, submitted by the uh, concession holder, especially from the uh, HGU, from the plantation, uh, uh, the plantation is under uh, the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, uh, guidance. Uh, with this also, uh, we invite uh, the uh, representative from uh, the Ministry of Agriculture to be in the uh, team in reviewing this document and also uh, reviewing uh, the, the, the reporting uh, for what the uh, uh, concession holders already uh, done so far based on the, uh, uh, the document of the pitland restoration plan that they already certified. Okay, so how, how the communication is carried out? Yes, first we have to uh, discuss, uh, identify every meaning of the regulation in the same perception with them. In the same uh, target that we need. Yes, indeed, sometimes we found several uh, different perception, different interests especially in uh, the uh, pitland uh, 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 restoration and conservation in cultivation area but so far we can uh, uh, discuss and the uh, plantation already submit uh, that already submit the uh, uh, plan uh, for restoration pitland restoration is more than 50 uh, company thank you good so um Water is one thing, and the, the enemy of fire is water. We would like to hear more about how fire is controlled and how it is related to the management of water, especially water level in, in restored peatland. We would like to hear more from pa Raffles Panjaitan, who is the director of fire control under the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. Pa Raffles. Thank you, uh, Professor. Muriarso, first of all, I would like thanks for giving me a chance to present what's the lesson learned and commitment of government for handling the forest fire during the last three years. As a forest and land fire are challenges that must be facing by all, all over the world, especially not only develop, de uh, developing country but also developed countries. Based on this, in imperative of the countries that have forest and land fire issues, including Indonesia, to continuously improve forest and land fire control effort by resolving the problems in accordance with their respective characteristics. Uh, the first, I would like to show you the condition the last three years of forest fire in Indonesia. The indicator of the early detection forest and land fire is measured, is uh, captured by the satellite pro in satellite to be a hotspot. And the definition of hotspots, I think we are already uh, know that has been uh, uh, captured from the different satellite can be from MODIS, NOAA, and NPP. The condition of forest fires during 2015-2017 was experienced with several fire damage. It's about 2.6 million hectares land forest area and decreased significantly 2000. 16 and 2017, you see from the grab, I think this morning already some panelists also mentioned the result of the uh, effort of Indonesia. Next, the emission from the forest fire also we can measure during the last two years. It's also decreased uh, the number, especially from greenhouse gas, and also, next slide, please. Indonesian, there's a mobility officer for dealing with forest and land fire problem. It is Directorate Forest and Land Fire Management under the Directorate General uh, Climate Change. 
that also we have some uh, unit in the field, in the provincial level, that also combat or manage the forest fire land. In accordance with the Ministry Environment Regulation number 32, 2016, Forest Land Fire Control, the Provincial Tax Force is a forest and land fire control organization in the province that performs coordinated function as an ad hoc. The Provincial Tax Force is appointed by the governor, located in the provincial government offices, having the function of the coordinating and planning, organizing, operating, monitoring and evaluation in any forest land fire control effort. The Provincial Coordinating Tax Force and Forest Land Fire Control is chaired by Governor and consisting of the Regional Secretariat, Regional Development Planning Board, and Regional Disaster Management Agency, the Regional Environment Agency, the Technical Service Officer for Forestry, Plantation, Agriculture, and all technical service other relevant such as Mangala Agni, sub-district, municipal government, the surrounding of provincial government. The regional police and the local army and other related agencies in accordance with their level of authority. The human resources for forest fire plant, uh, prevention is mainly is controlled since 2002 the Ministry of Environment Forestry has established the Forest Land Fire Brigade as a well-known Mangala Agni. The Forest and Land Fire Brigade is work unit having duties and responsibility for conducting prevention, suppression, post fire handling activities, SLS, SLS evacuation and rescue, support in the forest and land fire control in the field. Currently, Mangala Agni has been established in 12 forest and land fire prone provinces with 37 local fire stations, we call it Mangala, Daobos Mangala Agni, and consists of 1,980 personnel. Each Mangala Agni team consists of 15 personnel with the composition of one person as a head and 14 members. Besides Mangala Agni, that established by Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Forest and Land Fire Brigade, which are also established in the Forest Management Unit, such as Forest Management Unit KPH, and companies in forestry and plantation. The equipment we actually have, Mangala Agni, have some various facility and equipment needed to support evaluation and control. The approach which we have implementation during the two years is one is the big changes from uh, suppression activity, we changed to paradigms activity where prevention activity that we are implementing, we support all the resources until to the uh, rest lowest level, such as villages. And also the government has uh, launching the green desi grand design for forest prevention and suppression uh, coordination with ministry, coordinator, economic, Bapanas and ministry of environment. Uh, by the commitment of the government, as President Jokowi stated, every year during the 2016, 2017, and uh, 2018, the last February, it is, it's, uh, indicate that government Indonesia are really serious to combat the forest fire all over Indonesia. So from this, our lesson and commitment for the next during the last two years, we have uh, get effort should be become benchmarking for 
combating the forest fire in the next future and also increasing the cooperation, commitment and hard working with the multi-stakeholder to, to reduce the number of hotspots and burn area. Most important, the readiness and handling forest and land fire through initial attack, early suppression has to be priority for all prone forest land in the provincial. Commitment and compliance to protect the working area of the private sectors should be more implemented. Readiness of human resources and equipment for all stakeholders and community involvement in the forest and land fire prevention to the more uh, attention. And the last, the action law enforcement we have to implement to all uh, private sector, especially who uh, the actor to burn the uh, land or area in uh, their uh, forest or outside the forest. I think this is the, our presentation. Uh, Moderator, thank you for your candidate. So we hear it's very expensive investment here in terms of fighting or suppressing fire. Uh, we also hear about the uh, law enforcement uh, as far as fire is concerned, but we didn't hear much about preparedness. Perhaps in one word you can explain to us how the preparedness uh, done across uh, the government agencies with participation with people. Thank you. Uh, we have done a prevention during the last two years by coordination among stakeholders, especially uh, ministerial, as the central level, provincial level, and district level. All the resource from the uh, government and stakeholder, especially uh, the private company that they are uh, manage the pitland area is very big by the new regulation, Ministry of Environment, as I said before, number 32, 2016, all the private sector, they are already fulfilled the resources, especially for equipment, for the personnel, and the controlling the every year their area. This is not happened before 2016, never. During the last two uh, 2016, it's become more attention and we have also already some inspect to the some company. They have already uh, prepared some equipment, and also they are uh, try to inform the local people surrounding the area to be uh, informed to prevent the fire by gi by uh, give taking them to the uh, group to control the fire and give some incentive by the company. Also, the government from Ministry of Forestry to teach the local people to be more uh, community uh, uh, mangala, uh, masyarakat peduli api to be more uh, attends to when the fire occur. They are, must be the first responder to uh, give to put it up. Or if they not can to put it up, they can give some information to us by command center. We are already settled in. Uh, province and communicate to the central government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parafles. Next, we will hear how the international community is going to participate in this process. Andrew Campbell is the CEO or director of ACR, who is planning to do something in central Kalimantan and uh, how issues related to livelihood is taken care of when um, pitland management and uh, managing uh, degraded pitland is going to be taking place. Andrew. Um, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to, uh, to this event. And I'm sorry we, the speakers can't see the, uh, <laughs> the slides. Um, I put that slide up mainly to, because um, it's an excuse for showing my own farm uh, in, uh, in southeastern Australia with my own woodlots. Um, so I'm a forester professionally, but also involved in um, 
in farm forestry on my own farm. Um, and ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, is uh, we're part of the foreign affairs portfolio in Australia. I report direct to Foreign Minister Julie Bishop, and we organise and fund uh, research partnerships between Australia and countries in our region, and we've been working in Indonesia with Indonesian partners for many years. So it's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many of our researchers uh, in the room. Next slide, please. Um, I, I have a few very simple points. Um, I'm a great fan of the historian Simon Sharma, and he says that uh, landscapes are where nature meets culture. And I think uh, for us biophysical scientists, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to understand nature. Uh, we don't spend as much time trying to understand culture and how that shapes the landscape and the interaction between uh, social and cultural uh, values and perceptions and hopes and fears on the way in which landscapes are managed. So we won't be able to develop durable solutions to the problems of peatlands uh, unless the people uh, are looked after. You can't look after the peat without looking after the people who live in and around the peat. So our durable solutions require viable alternative livelihoods for the people who are living in and around uh, the peat. Next slide, please. So if you think about the implications of what seems like a very simple statement, it means that we need multidisciplinary approaches and we need to be able to work across multiple agencies. No single government department, uh, no single industry or no single level has all the tools they need to tackle this complex problem. So we need forestry and environment and fisheries and agriculture and uh, the economics portfolios working together on these issues with civil society and with industry and with local communities especially. So that requires both in science and in policy and in the interface between them approaches that are both multidisciplinary, so they involve a lot of different perspectives, but transdisciplinary in that they involve the end users as well as the scientists, the experts. Uh, experts cannot solve the problem of the peatlands. They can contribute ideas and knowledge, but ultimately the local people on the ground uh, have to be involved and have to have ownership. So I was involved in a program in Australia called Land Care, uh, which we've been doing for 30 years. And it's, I think we can say that we have changed social norms. 40 or 50 years ago, a farmer who planted trees in Australia was seen as a bit odd, uh, was seen as eccentric or strange. Now, planting trees is seen as good farming. So we have changed the perceptions around that land use. Uh, and I think we need to be thinking about how you change social norms to look after peatlands. Um, next slide, please, my final slide. So uh, this is very early stages, but uh, my agency, ACR, and our sister agency, DFAT, are working with uh, a range of Indonesian partners um, that uh, are listed there, um, uh, chiefly Fortia and IARD, but also other partners, universities and NGOs, along with CSIRO and ANU and Australian universities, um, uh, James Cook and... Um, uh, Latrobe and Sunshine Coast, 
to develop a long-term uh, research program on peatlands. Um, I've said to our uh, staff that we should be planning for at least 10 years, but in my view, probably 20 years of work on this issue. I don't see it as an issue that can be solved in a three-year project. So we need to take the time to understand the drivers of peatland uh, fire in particular, and to ensure that we're dealing with the core drivers, not just the symptoms of the problem. Um, so I don't want to make any grand promises, except that we will try to work very closely with our Indonesian partners for a long time on a complex problem. But it's wonderful that you have reduced the number of fires so much. Uh, the time will tell in the next big drought uh, if in 10 years' time or 20 years' time the, the number is still so low. Um, we've been working with fire research in Australia for a long time. And uh, I was the head of the northern node of the bushfires CRC in Australia. And for the first 15 years of that cooperative research centre, the emphasis was on suppression. How can we get better at putting fires out? Better mapping, uh, infrared, um, better helicopters, uh, aerial bombing of fires. And then we had the very, very big fires uh, of 2009, which we couldn't put out. They burnt for ma many months. And we realised that uh, for better fire management, we needed to invest in anthropology. We needed to understand the psychology of arson. We needed to understand the community psychology of preparedness, uh, of uh, why is it that some people listen to uh, warnings or advice and other people don't? How can you share information across a society when there is no telephones and no electricity? So um, these are really interesting questions in contemporary fire management. So um, that's why I think this is a long-term problem and, and I'm very happy to be working with you on it. And we look forward to uh, hopefully a very productive partnership and uh, with many of the people in the room. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Give applause to Andrew. One thing I would like to uh, perhaps uh, hear the emphasis here. In the first three years that you are planning, uh, is there any way of capturing or learning the lessons, success and failure from the past? Uh, do, do you have any intention to do that? To quicken the process? <laughs> yes. So the answer is yes. So. Uh, as promised, I think uh, to wake you up, you also have the opportunity to ask questions to our first three speakers uh, on issues that they are trying to share with us concerning uh, control of water, fire, and international collaboration, especially those who are emphasizing in the livelihood aspect of uh, the people. Questions from floors? You raising your hand? Faisal and then Ibu Johan, one more maybe over, over here. No? Okay, let's start with two. Did I see it? Okay, sorry. Your name is? Okay, you will be the third one. Okay. Yeah. Faisal. Thank you. Please identify yourself. Faisal Parish Global Environment Center, Malaysia. So for Ibu Ati, I think, uh, as you presented, there's been good progress to secure agreement of the private sector to rehabilitate the peatland area, very large area, by enhancing water level and, in some cases, restoring degraded area. However, that's very fantastic success. I think 2.3 million hectares you mentioned. But what have been the main challenges to get to that? Uh, has there been resistance? Was there full agreement? What, what challenges have you faced? Secondly, for Pat Raffles, 
uh, you showed the fantastic reduction from uh, 2015 to 2017 in the fires. And uh, you emphasize the importance of the multi-stakeholder uh, engagement as a model for other countries to follow. Uh, what is your hope for 2018? Will there be further reduction or further challenge? Uh, as other Andrew mentioned, uh, the drought year will be coming and El Nino will come in the future. So do you feel the strategy you've adopted now will be adequate for the El Nino year or would you need uh, further work to be done? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tut Johan from Universitas Gajah Mada. I have the question for Ibu Ati. The stakeholder empowerment in the tropical pit management, how far it works because it's a lot of area. So I think my question not far from Pak Paris. Okay. And the second question for Pak Raples. Do you think that the decrease of the fire due to the condition of rainy season, I mean last year we have all years rainy season and this year also we still have rainy season. So I think my question also not far away. So because maybe next year will coming the El Nino year. So we have, no, we have to be careful about that in declaration that we decrease the fire. And the third question for Professor Campbell, transdisciplinary approach, can you elaborate more how far that it's worked? Because you said you did that in Australia. So how, the, how can we approach that? So I agree with you. Planting the trees, it's not three years work. It's a lot of years, 10 to 20 years. So I think we have also in Indonesia to think about that. So how do we can increase the livelihood for the people surrounding the pitland area? So thank you very much. Hello, um, my name is Laura Graham from the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation in Kalimantan. Um, I was uh, very interested to hear about uh, Pat Raffles presenting on Jokowi's 11 steps to fire reduction, his uh, new strategy. Um, I was also interested to see that when you presented on the fire area in 2015, there was a differentiation between the areas that were on mineral soil and the areas that were on peatland. Um, the project that I work on is looking at how uh, peatland fires transition down into the peat, because of course you can have a peatland surface fire that has a degree of emissions, but it's when the fire goes down into a, the peat that the emissions are much more severe. Of course, on mineral soil, you will have the surface fire, but you can't have a subsequent peat fire. So I'm wondering if within those 11 uh, steps of Jokowi's strategy, is there um, differentiation whether the fire is occurring on mineral or on peatland? And should the fire management strategy differentiate between if it's a mineral soil, if it's a peatland surface fire, or if it's actually a fire that has already gone down into the peat? Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the question, for Harry's question. The first, uh, the key point is how to make it ours, being ignored in the first, to be the person being searched by everybody to get the supervision and facilitation to uh, pitland restoration and management. It is indeed really difficult for us in the first session of our uh, public uh, communication, our uh, socialization, our workshop, when we invite 
the uh, uh, concession holders about the uh, regulation related to the pitland uh, restoration and management, several complaints come and then ignore. But in the end, they come asking for uh, help, facilitation, but it is indeed take time. We have to patient to talk, to communicate with them using their language, of course. Don't ever talk with, oh, you have to uh, restore the uh, pit land because uh, uh, it will be a disaster for the uh, community and so on and so on. And the regulation mentioned this. Don't ever talk with this. Talk that the ecosystem, uh, pit land ecosystem is very, very valuable. Not only for the government of Indonesia, of only, not only for the community, but also the sustainability of their business. Find this kind of language is, we have to be practiced. First, not success. And then secondly, and so on. And in the end, as I already mentioned before, uh, regarding to uh, uh, Prof. Daniel questions, first being ignored by the uh, plantation. And then currently, there are 80 concession holders in the plantation already have the certification and already Im implement the uh, restoration, uh, uh, pitland restoration and management. How far it work? As I already mentioned before, it works. The achievement is already far. The number of the, com uh, the company, the industries, the number of communities that already involved also. But being patient is the most important thing. Use another language when the first you have to come up, you have to face the difficulties, try another way to discuss, to talk to the stakeholders. Thank you, Aiden. Thank you. Well, first of all, Mr. Paisal, of course, in 2018, if El Nino comes, but uh, I don't know exactly whether it's come or not, but based on a BMKG, they said this year is more uh, uh, hot than 2017. If we are implementing all the action that has been done since 2000, I think my, question, my answer will relate it to Ibu UGM. Uh, we use, we implement the instruction of Jokowi, we involve the local people, the lowest level, the Kepala Desa, uh, Babinsa, Babi Kaptit Mas, Mangala Agni, and uh, stakeholders and local community is to become one group to patrol the villages. Since 2016, we just implemented, we started. Before, we never used this system. I have in, in, investigated and uh, indicate 1,000 through 204 villages is very from fire in 12 provinces. Those, this area is become the, my target to patrol by consists of the uh, Babinsa. Why we use the Babinsa and uh, police army? Because mostly people in the lowest level, sometimes they're not aware if only local or only the villages, the head of villages instructions. When we use integrated petrol, so that the fire, the hotspots is decreased. Why decrease? Because before <coughs> uh, fire become larger or bigger, the team suddenly suppress the, uh, suppress the fire, so it's not big, bigger. It happens during the two years. And if we implement this during the 2018, will be, I hope, will be the same as 2017 at least. Uh, the, the number increasing is around 80% uh, 
for uh, 2015. And the second thing for Johan from UGM was the effort is become of the weather season or because of action. I can show you what the action the 2015, 2016, 17, and 18. In 2015, we employ so many aircraft, so many action in the field, but no happen. It's, it's not decrease the fire. It's almost 1,200,000 ton air water <laughs> spread from the aircraft. It's not put it up the fire. We have experienced it too. So 2.6 million hectares was burned 2015. But when we changed the 2016, we used the integrated petrol with the uh, babinsa, babinsa and mass, and man my mangal acne. It grew through the fillets that already ident identified 2015 is the, the very prone area because the fire always happen in the same villages. It can be uh, reduced three times or three years because they want to clear the area during three time seasons. So why we why we doing? We identified the days, the villages and petrol in that area so that no one can burn the area. I show you. In 2015, there are 32 aircraft helicopter to use for suppression. Uh, the water is 150 million, and also the uh, modification water, mod uh, sorry, rain, artificial, one 215 ton salt spread, but it's not happen. But in 2016. We only use 16 aircraft, and the water is 100 million liters spread from the air. Also, we use uh, modifications weather spread 128 salt. And in 2017, we use 26 aircraft to suppress the initial fire. So when we attack with suppression by aircraft, not to suppress the big fire, suppress this small fire. So so it's not make a bigger fire. It's what happened. Why two, two years it's become uh, significant decrease the number. So both the activity from the air and the uh, ground suppression is working together by command system, command system with already set up in eight province prone area. This year, if all this work and supporting by funding, of course, the money, without money you can work. Yeah, I, I hope 2018, it could be uh, more like 2017. Recently, I was told you, during the January until uh, April, now the hotspot a little bit higher than the last years yeah and also uh, the action in the field we have already support some integrated petrol to Riau province uh, Kalimantan Barat and Kalimantan Tengah integrated petrol and the helicopter water bombing has been done 3.2 million liter water in Riau, has been done to put it up the fire is the remote area. It is will be more efficient if we use the helicopter water bombing when the fire is still small. If the bigger, it cannot happen. This is ah mineral fire. Mineral fire, yes. The mineral fire which we implemented also the for the yeah. Uh, the uh, inter integrated petrol. Yeah? The problem is in mineral fire, it's, it's happened. Maybe uh, one day it's uh, finished. The haze is not effect. Yeah? It's not big effect to the haze. But even the emis emission also that can uh, produce emission, but it's not as much as 
pot pit lamp uh, fire. This is the. I think this my question. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, to Ibu, the professor from UGM, uh, you asked about transdisciplinary research. Um, maybe I, I should share a paper with you that I wrote last year on uh, the differential roles of funders and researchers and end users in transdisciplinary research. Um, but for me, multidisciplinary research is when you look at the same problem through different disciplinary lenses, but the disciplines don't necessarily work together in doing so. Interdisciplinary is when you bring different disciplines together and sometimes you finish up having a baby and making a new discipline, like uh, ecological economics or something like that. But transdisciplinary is when you don't just have the scientists working but also the end users of the research are involved in the inquiry process. Sometimes in helping to formulate the question but more often in gathering data and in an adaptive way starting to use the results of the research um, as it's still happening and uh, then obviously in scaling out the work. So um, uh, again we have a, a big tradition of this type of work with farmers in Australia through farming systems research groups and also an environment um, through, uh, through land care groups and friends of groups and others. And citizen science is a, has a, a lot to contribute in transdisciplinary research. So I'm happy to share that paper with you uh, afterwards. But I think for complex long-term problems like this, then uh, you need to have the, um, the people who, whose actions need to be involved in the solution also need to be involved in gathering the information and helping to frame the, the management options. If people have been involved in gathering the data, they're more likely to trust the results than if they're just told this is the answer by the experts. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's the first round. You, you can always come back to the speakers later, but uh, we expect from the next speakers to be more practical and perhaps also give some recommendation related to the aspect they've been talking about. So um, we have the first speaker, Solihin. Uh, Solihin is a, with Diameter, a consulting firm. It's been producing a lot of maps and all kind of tools uh, related to peatland uh, ecosystem. So um, Ichin, that's what I call him, to share what it's been done with regard to peatland, uh, biomass, vegetation distribution, pit depth, uh, canal, etc. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Padanil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for, from the uh, organizer that already inviting me here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about several aspects related to uh, inventories and mappings in pitland so actually i previously i have about 21 slides but pa daniel uh, insists me to have only to reduce it to uh, 10 but i can only be 11 so i think it's a, it should be okay uh, yeah so there are four actually four aspects that i'm going to talk about First is related with biomass inventory, and the second is about uh, improved land cover mapping using LIDAR, and the third is about pit depth mapping, and the fourth is about canal mappings using LIDAR as well. Uh, so pit depth mapping, maybe I can also explain a little bit uh, what we, we do related uh, with the pit mapping price. And so this is not part of diameter actually, but I will explain it anyway. So next, please. Uh, yeah, there are uh, currently we have a lot of uh, data sets related with uh, forest and biomass inventory. Uh, 
especially uh, we use it for forest reference emission level, but yeah, we, we found that it is not uh, sufficient for especially if uh, subnational or provincial or district or project level want uh, to use it. Normally they develop their own uh, develop their own uh, survey uh, itself. So there are several components that you have to consider. First is stratifications. I think it is very important because uh, it can uh, reduce the uncertainty uh, or standard error, or it can also reduce the, the number of uh, samples if you want to uh, attain certain, certain accuracy. So it is very important because uh, and it's possible right now because we have a lot of uh, base map related with land cover, so you can use land cover map as uh, stratifications. Uh, but for Indonesia, because we have you know a huge area, and currently we only use stratifications uh, in island, so island as the stratifications. But uh, we suggest if we want to develop. Uh, sampling design, stratification using land cover map is very important. So currently we have 23 classes, 23 classes of land cover, and yeah, not all uh, classes has been covered by sufficient uh, plots. So this is quite uh, challenging. And but actually we also have many other initiatives related with the uh, uh, biomass or for vegetation inventory. So I think this is also interesting how we can integrate these initiatives into, into one uh, single database that can be used for uh, biomass uh, mapping. And the second component is uh, related with sampling method. So I think it is, uh, it's, it's not so, uh, I mean, there are several options but we can choose either systematic sampling, random sampling, or line sampling. So three of them are uh, accept, acceptable. Uh, so it depends on, you know, on the uh, maybe terrain or accessibilities or things like that. So, and then, yeah, for, for biomass inventory, we have to consider the uh, major car carbon pools. We, have we know we have five carbon pools, but uh, I'm sure uh, not all carbon pools are important in, a, in our ecosystem. So for example, for peatland, normally I skip the litter because it's, uh, it's, it's very, very low percentage. And for standard error, uh, uh, we have actually currently we have a national standard for carbon inventory. And now it's uh, under revision, so we, we, we are revising this uh, standard. And 20% uh, of standard error is uh, mentioned in this, uh, in this national standard. So I think 5 to 20% should be, should, be, should be okay. So if you are working for project level, I think aiming at 5 should be, should be safe. Uh, because sometimes after the result, normally you get higher uh, uh, uncertainty, so less than 20 should be, should be fine. And make sure that you do this for multiple uh, purposes, so not only for biomass, but also, for example, for vegetations or fires or wildlife, so that the, the, the cost is, uh, it is expensive anyway, but you get more data set, so that's uh, the idea of uh, multi-purpose inventory and yeah uh, for integrating the existing initiatives it is important that you have a certain platform so this is something that uh, uh, we we are lacking of so yeah I think uh, this is something that maybe the government of Indonesia can can think about this how to integrate the existing forest inventory into, into the, the system. And the next uh, slide, please. So for pit swamp forest, we already have uh, allometric equation specific for pit swamp forest, 
trees in Indonesia. So we already uh, published uh, these equations in 2014 uh, based on samples from Sumatra and uh, Kalimantan uh, pit swamp forest, uh, which is from it's quite uh, uh, the number of samples quite high. So uh, it's 146 samples from diameter five to 100. 60 centimeters, so it's huge trees uh, we have uh, cut down. And from this, we differentiated the equations uh, based on species grouping or mixed species. So if, uh, you know, if we have, uh, uh, let's say, detailed data about diameter, tree height, and, and uh, a wood density, then I suggest you to use these equations uh, for mixed species should be should be fine, but yeah. Otherwise, a species group can reduce the uncertainty, and even you don't you don't you don't need the wood density for 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 this as long as you know is it deep tall cups or non deep tall cups, and is it a light wood or heavy wood. So it can can help you to to reduce the uncertainty of the biomass estimation. So this already published in in. Uh, 2014. Uh, yeah, but sometimes it is often important for you to validate the existing equations. So if you have enough resources, I think it's very good to cut a little bit some, some more trees to validate this. But sometimes it's not possible to cut uh, trees in, in the area, for example, in national park or... Okay, so two minutes already. Yeah, but uh, we also develop a method for non-destructive sampling using terrestrial uh, LiDAR. So, yeah, I will talk about this uh, if you want later on. And the next one is to improve the land cover mapping. I think this is also important that uh, if you have LiDAR, this is something that LiDAR can do best, is the height of, of the vegetation. So canopy height model can be used to, to improve the land cover mapping. This is the example of how we develop the uh, land cover mapping using, uh, using canopy. Uh, next, please, sorry. Next. Yeah, this one is uh, uh, maps for, for land cover mapping and fused with the canopy height model. Next, please. So this is the results uh, from the KFGP project. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Pa Graham Applegate providing me this data. So we, we use this uh, the LiDAR data and use for estimating the land cover map or creating developing land cover maps based on the height, the three heights. And you can see this is uh, the table is the the uh, the, the the heights uh, class. And you can see the graph is the variations or the estimations of the, the height and the, the standard error with the, the error bar. So you can see in the middle is the study using LiDAR. It's, uh, it's more, all of the classes is significantly different compared with other uh, maps. Next, please. We also develop li uh, li uh, above ground biomass using LiDAR. And this is uh, involving ground measurements and develop regression model uh, based on re uh, ground measurement and LiDAR matrix. And then in the right map, you can see this, the, 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 the left map is the land cover and the right map is uh, above ground biomass. You can see the variation is, is really high even in the same land cover maps. Next, please.